Hi everyone and welcome to Värt att veta, worth knowing. Um, those that were here early saw what we had on the screen. It's uh, a bit information about uh, GDPR. So in connection with the new European data protection regulation, we want to inform you who visit lectures in this lecture series uh, that we will be filming this lecture and the questions, uh, the sessions with the questions after the lecture. The lecture is broadcasted live uh, on the web and it's also made available on YouTube where the film may lie for a two year per period. Remember that you can be, se been seen, be seen <laughs> in the film if you are in front of the camera. Uh, in connection with the lecture, we will also might take some photos. Uh, after the talk in the question session, uh, you will get the opportunity to ask questions. So no questions during the talk. Uh, and that's because you need to talk into the microphone so we get the question and the answer in the film. But keep in mind that your voice will be heard even on the film then, and technically this is the personal information that falls within GDPR regulation. Uh, and if you have attended the previous, uh, that worth knowing, then there is already a movie on YouTube. Uh, and links to the film can be seen on uh, uh, www.slu.se, worth knowing, värt att veta. And please contact one of us who works with these lectures if you have anything to object to your voice being included in such a film. Um, so after this <laughs> more formal information, I hope you have uh, got the nice soup and bread. And um, I would also like to tell you a bit about this autumn, because in autumn we will have more of these lectures, but it is but as last year we will have these lectures in autumn in English, and there will be more for the house. Uh, and uh, in spring next year we will have these more open lectures that where we also will invite uh, those that work outside the university. So I would like to you to keep your eyes open for this uh, lecture ser series in the autumn. And if you have any suggestions on what we should, uh, or who should have a lecture, then you just contact me and tell me. So I should also <laughs> inform you about this uh, Professors Installationen, 24th of May, in P.O. Bäckströms Saal. There, our new professors will have uh, talks from 9 to 10.30. It will be Karin Öhman, Ola Lindros, and Thomas Rudin. And you are all very welcome to attend these seminars, too. But now, we will listen to Nils. So welcome Nils. Nils will talk about will children create climate change concern among denialists in the US. So welcome to the stage. Well, thanks for having me here. It sounds like we're all going to be in a movie together, so that's exciting. Um, I'd like to start just by uh, thanking the Nicholson Endowment for supporting my trip here and Pernella for being a, a great host and uh, also acknowledge Danielle, who is the incredible graduate student who coordinated a lot of the research I'll be presenting, and Catherine, her uh, co-advisor. So I'll start with a little exercise uh, for everybody. How many people here learned something from their parents? <laughs> All right. How, how many of you who have children have learned something from your children? OK, so fewer, probably because fewer of you have children. But that, in its essence, is intergenerational learning. And it's the theoretical idea behind what I'll be presenting today. And as you can imagine, that's the oldest form of human education there is, right? And typically, we think of it as people learning from their parents. But it can be something that operates backwards, where children teach their parents. And that'll be the, the core part of it that I'll be discussing today. And I'm not going to dive deep into climate change. just. I'll just review the idea that it is a big environmental challenge and that we know a lot of sort of technical ways to address it, 
and how to deal with it, but the sort of crux that we're dealing with is collective action, figuring out a way to get enough support to collectively follow through on the technical solutions that we know about. And uh, one of the challenges to building this sort of coalition for collective action is getting enough public support for doing so. In the United States context, we have this challenge in terms of political or partisan gaps uh, for concern about the environmental and environment in general, but particularly climate change. Um, I always get confused on, confused on which side is which. But so if, if you look on the, your left side, you can see this partisan gap in terms of just whether or not the environment is a top issue, and not the top, but just a top issue to deal with. And on the right side, you see those same statistics for climate change. And the climate change uh, issue is actually becoming more polarized. So people on the political left or Democrats, uh, about half of them see it as a top issue, not necessarily the top issue. And only about 15% of people on the political right or Republicans see that as an issue. <coughs> and people advocating doing something about climate change have attempted to address this issue through strategic framing or trusted messengers where they can find someone like the Pope who might be trusted among the political right and sharing the message about climate change being real and being something that poses risks through that trusted messenger. The challenge is we've found that there's still not enough trust. <laughs> so if people aren't able to sort of trust Leonardo DiCaprio or the Pope, right? Who are they going to trust? And the idea here is maybe their own children. That's like sort of our last best hope, right? Um, and But before we could see if children are able to convey this message, we had to see if we could effectively convey it to children, right? And so we did a, a study to look at that. That's what you see on your, your right here. But I'll first, I'll go over the, the figure on the left. There's been several studies in the US that show this troubling phenomenon where the better people get at science and math and the more they understand about science, the more polarized they get. So learning about it makes it worse instead of making it better. So if you're really good at science and you're on the left, then you think it's an even bigger issue. But if you're really good at science and you're on the right, you've filtered all the information to the point that you think it's less of an issue than you would if you weren't good at science. <laughs> So that's obviously kind of a non-starter. And the question is, do kids operate this way? And fortunately, they don't. Um, I think this presentation will be available later, and it should have a hyperlink to uh, this study in it. Uh, but what we found working with children is they still have these sort of ideological divides in middle school and high school and the early teens. But they're much more malleable. And when you go from low scientific understanding of the issue to high scientific understanding, the uh, sort of individualistic right-leaning children uh, catch up with their left-leaning counterparts. And at high levels of climate knowledge, all the kids think it's real and poses risks and at the same level. So it works with kids. And so now we're going to move from can kids learn about it effectively despite their ideological differences to can they be messengers to their parents? And this just provides some background uh, to whether they can. And while this hasn't been studied before in terms of climate change, it had been studied before in a lot of other contexts. So uh, if in terms of marketing, the sort of big charismatic thing in, in the US is sugary cereals. So the advertising for uh, like candy flavored cereals is all with cartoons and things like that because it's targeting children. And they've done research to show children are really good at conv convincing their parents to buy these horrible foods. <laughs> so, so that child to parent inter intergenerational learning is very effective there. Um, when you move just from marketing to something that is ideologically charged, like climate change, it's also proven very effective. So when children are the messengers, they're able to change their parents' views on sexual orientation, which in the US is very ideologically charged, and parents aren't able to be swayed on those issues by other sources. So we're able to see through these other domains that it seems like something that might work in the case of climate change. Uh, this slide shows let me see if our study area, which is in the eastern coastal part of North Carolina, the, the state where I'm working in at North Carolina State. And that's where we did our case study with uh, uh, children in uh, middle school. And we were looking to see if we could design a curricula that helped uh, 
children recognize the importance of climate change and the risks it poses, and then helps them convey that to their parents through intergenerational learning. And one of the things I actually discussed with one of your colleagues in Uppsala was a lot of times what children learn in school isn't conveyed to their parents, so why might this work and other things not? And, and I mentioned that a key aspect of this is the curricula has to be designed specifically to encourage uh, participation of the parents. If it's not, then it won't happen even if the children learn the material. So the curriculum we designed uh, followed key elements uh, associated with intergenerational learning where you, you talked about local issues that likely would be relevant to the parents. Um, it was longer term, which is just general best practice for educational interventions. Uh, it was hands-on. Uh, the teachers were excited about it, and it encouraged uh, parental participation, and I'll talk about the specific elements that did that uh, in the next slide. So first, the curriculum we used was called uh, Wildlife, Weather, and Climate Change, and that's also linked to this slide. Uh, but it used uh, impacts of climate on wildlife as sort of the mechanism of teaching about uh, weather and climate, how they differed, and what impacts they would have. Um, we recruited, actually, uh, 23 teachers, and due to a historically large hurricane uh, that impacted the area, we actually lost several of the teachers. So we ended up with uh, 15, not lost the teachers. I saw someone raise their eyebrows there. They, they withdrew from the study because their schools were closed for long periods of time. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so everybody was safe. Remember that. All right, and we ended up with 15 classrooms and uh, Eight of them were in the treatment, seven of them were in the control. And they, the ones in the treatment used this uh, weather, wildlife, and climate change module. Uh, it included, and, and key elements of that module designed to engage parents uh, were first a service learning project. So it was sort of authentic outside work where they were doing projects relevant to climate change, like restoring wetlands that have been destroyed or installing like oyster reef bars and things like that to uh, improve the coastal resilience to increased wave action. Um, they were long-term, uh, uh, the modules were long-term in, in the sense that they took a semester to carry out. Uh, they, they addressed local issues, the wildlife examples were local, at, uh, local wildlife, so they were looking at how sea level rise could impact uh, diamondback terrapins or how temperature change might remove habitat for northern flying squirrels in our local mountains as, it went up, as the habitat sort of shrunk going up higher elevations. We didn't, we didn't talk about polar bears or anything like that. And we encouraged parental involvement through having the students interview their parents about long-term patterns and weather in their communities, uh, and also through having the children put out blog posts and things like that for the community about their service learning projects. In terms of analysis, I, I was told this was supposed to be entertaining, so I'm going to do very minimal <laughs> Uh, discussion of the analysis, but we basically did a big complex regression model where we predicted change in uh, the children and the parents' uh, concern about climate change and the risks it posed. And we, uh, the variables that we predicted that with were whether they were in the treatment or control groups. We included pretest scores because if you're already really concerned, then the change is going to be smaller than if you're not. We wanted to account for that. Um, and then also a bunch of demographic variables that have been linked to concern about climate change in the past. Uh, we had a random effect variable that accounted for the grouping within classrooms and also within families that we were surveying. And we did a mediation test to see if the treatment of the kids was the only thing affecting parents or if it was mediated through the kids. And so the treatment was actually impacting the kids and the kids impacting the parents. So. This is the core of the results, uh, and what you see in this figure is just that there was a complete mediation. So the treatment predicted variance in change in uh, parental climate concern, but when you accounted for the change in the children's concern, that direct link disappeared, uh, just meaning that it was totally mediated. And we did some mediation tests, like the Sobel test, to, and it was highly significant. And the exciting part here wasn't just that uh, children were conveying that message or that things were mediated. <laughs> um, but it was also sort of how they were mediated and which parents were most impacted by their children in regards to concern about climate change. So the first thing we found is that there was an interaction between the parents' uh, personal ideology 
and how effective the children were. And the, the short version is that children of conservative parents elicited more change than children of uh, less conservative parents. So it was more effective with the people who were the most likely to be denialists in the first place. And that's after accounting for their pretest scores. So it was a big change. Uh, it was also less effective for moms, meaning it was more effective for fathers. And again, in the US, uh, men are more likely to be denialists than women. So again, in both of these cases, it was most effective for the groups that were the most resistant to accepting the reality of climate change and the risks that it poses. And then finally, it was most effective when the family where that intergenerational learning was occurring was a family with a daughter relative to when it was a family with a son. And what I'm gonna do in the next few slides is just kind of show you the magnitude of the change. So if you can imagine the scale, the concern was four questions uh, that were aggregated about whether or not people believe climate change posed risk to themselves and society and future generations. So, and, and then we did a whole bunch of scale tests and statistics about that. But the basic idea is their score could range from negative eight to eight. And this is the control group. And the only thing you can see, there's not a lot of change between the pre and the post except for conservative parents. And there, there was a significant jump from very little concern to a little bit of concern. And that's not what you want in your uh, control group. <laughs> But we hypothesized that this partially could have been related to the huge uh, sort of historical hurricane that happened during the middle of our study and the fact that it was framed by a lot of the media as related to climate change. Um, but the good news is, is within our treatment group, the change was twice as big. So even though that group was the only group that changed in the control, they, can, they changed twice as much if they were parents of a treatment child. So there was big effects amongst the conservative leaning parents in the treatment. This is the control again, but when you're comparing mothers versus fathers of the children, and again, in the, in the pretest, there's not a lot going on uh, versus post-test in the control, but in the treatment, you see the big jumps in concern for the parents of the treatment children, but also the fathers had a significantly larger jump in their pre to post concern than the mothers, so it worked better amongst this, this, the fathers than the mothers. And then finally, we're looking about the families with the sons or the daughters who, who were in the study. And there's not much going on here in the uh, control group, except the, the one thing we did notice that was significant is that uh, parents with daughters started out with lower concern. And we weren't sure exactly why that might be, other than there's been some research showing that um, in the US, boys are more often sort of conveyors of science within their family as seen as doing science stuff. So maybe in these cases that what children already knew about climate change was uh, being conveyed less uh, when daughters were doing that uh, just in general without the treatment. But what we saw is in the treatment group, daughters were actually the most effective at eliciting concern about climate change. And uh, parents of daughters ended up more concerned than parents of sons, which is the opposite of what um, you saw in the pretest and in the control group. So, so just in, in summary, some of the important conclusions are first that this backwards intergenerational learning from children to parents works really well uh, in the case of climate change. And it works best in the context of the groups that are the most resistant to accepting climate change, which would be political conservatives and men. Um, it's important when one of the things we felt were, was really important about the curricula when we were getting feedback from teachers and students was that it was seen as authentic and that the service learning projects helped with that because students were able to actually go sort of see and feel and touch the environment in the context of climate change. It wasn't just classroom based. Um, and, it, and in terms of where we might go next with this, uh, one of the key things we want to address is how age fa factors into it. So we've, we've found basically we know that younger children, when they're really young, they haven't developed these sort of political ideologies. When they get into middle and high school, they start develop developing them, but they're malleable, they're changeable, and they're willing to learn. And then we know amongst sort of full-fledged adults that we're so rigid in terms of our ideology that nothing gets through and we actually get worse <laughs> when we learn more science. But there's somewhere in between that we don't know, like maybe it's in college or grad school or somewhere where learning doesn't work anymore. 
So pinning down that, that sort of tipping point is an important next step. I think new cultures, understanding this phenomenon outside the US is important. Obviously, we have somewhat unique context in terms of how we treat and respond to climate change and how our political system works. Um, and then I think this could apply to a lot of new issues. Uh, this sort of backwards intergenerational learning seems really well adapted to ideologically fraught and politically charged contexts, and they don't all have to be about climate change. Uh, we're working on a project now associated with marine debris, which is politically charged if for no other reason than some of the ways you address it are through things like regulations limiting the use of plastic grocery bags or banning uh, straws or having regulations about how what the waste stream is used. And any time regulations are imposed, <laughs> it becomes very contentious. So we're seeing if it works in that context. But we could, this could also be adapted to looking at specific behaviors that are climate relevant. Um, or from my perspective, I do a lot of work with wildlife conservation, and I feel like it would be interesting to look at this uh, intergenerational learning model in the context of uh, highly contentious wildlife issues. Uh, one issue that we were, Pernell and I were discussing was uh, poison or venomous snakes. Uh, one of our neighbor's child was bit by one and last week, and it caused a huge ruckus. But in general, they're rel relatively low risk, and, th and they have a lot of benefits in the ecosystem. But because of people's worldviews and past experiences, they're uh, kind of vilified. And children may be a good way to sort of tackle that issue when we've failed to do so using other educational models. Uh, and then continuing to build theory. So this isn't couched in a lot of really deep social theory other than the broad sort of umbrella of intergenerational learning. And I think we can work to, to place it more solidly into a theoretical uh, footing. Uh, this link is just here. It was really good timing to come and give this talk because yesterday the paper associated it with it was published. And as you might expect, getting the p given the political polarization around this issue, we've gotten a lot of feedback on both sides of the issue. My graduate student emailed me that I think she searched the media releases related to it, and the second one below the, the main paper was some web page that said we were brainwashing children and, and hiding all our secret methods behind a paywall and various things like that. Uh, and, and I thought another interesting issue relevant to the local context here is most of the media releases associated with it have your uh, Greta on there as the child representative of this, even though it's a US-based study. Uh, and, I, and I thought that was fascinating. And I, and I think one of the reasons she's such an effective messenger, actually, when I've talked to a few people here about it, they've asked, have you heard about our Greta? And that specific wording, I think, connotes the idea that people have kind of accepted her as representing them and almost being like, you know, like, in some ways, like very representative of what we think of of daughters who were the most effective messengers in our study. Um, so she's definitely a good messenger of that. And I think also when you listen to some of her speeches, she comes across as sort of being incapable of misleading people or, people or not having any guile, you know. And that's also how we treat our children and not how we treat other people who are trying to influence, uh, influence us on sort of ideologically charged issues. And I think the rest of my slides are just background statistics. So I'll open it up to questions at this point. Sure, thank you. So, questions? I think we have one here. <laughs> you were too close. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much for your interesting presentation. I actually have two quick questions. Um, I was wondering, are you planning to do a long-term follow-up? Because sometimes with those educational programs, you can say that it's wearing off after time, that after treatment, it's a quite drastic response, but then people kind of forget afterwards. That was question one. And question two was, um, have you also asked them about uh, self-reported behavior? Have there been maybe changes also in behavior, not only in concern? Um, so I'll, I'll try to address both of those. The f the, the f your first question was about sort of the long-term effects of this and whether, and whether we'd like to look at that. We'd love to. <laughs> We're not doing it right now. And I think that's kind of the common answer to that question in, the, in a lot of social science related, uh, related topics because it's so hard to get long-term funding. So I, th I think it would be fascinating to look at the lo long-term impacts and uh, that transition from sort of adolescence to adulthood 
is obviously very important in a lot of ways, and whether or not these changes persist across it is an important question to ask. It's just we don't have the resources to do it. One sort of hint towards what would happen, though, I think is related to the impacts on the parents. So the fact that this relatively small intervention, even though it was a few months, was able to not only change their perspectives, but change the perspectives of their parents who have already become adults and already did so with very different views in many cases, suggests that it's not something that's fleeting because they, they were able to change the views of their parents who were fairly sort of rigidly entrenched in denying it in many cases. Um, and then the, I, I got sidetracked. A second question. Behavior. Oh, behavior. So we did look at some behaviors, and there were some small effects. I, I think one of the five was significant. Uh, and it could have been partially because we had a sample size of about 300, so it wasn't a really powerful s sort of sample size for detecting differences, but they were relatively small compared to the changes I shared here. And I think part of that is that the ch the behaviors we were looking at when we tried to put a suite of climate relevant behaviors together um, were ones that uh, can't be changed easily just when your mind has changed because of the sort of social structural barriers to engaging in them. So it's relatively easy to uh, engage in recycling if it's provided by the community you live in. But if it's not, and you have to like put it in your car and drive it 100 miles or 150 kilometers, uh, then you defeat the purpose, plus it's really hard. So when we were looking at things like using alternative transportation and buses, we didn't find a significant effect, but it was probably largely due to the fact that randomly people didn't have any access to buses to get around. So, so I think one of the next steps is figuring out behaviors that are relevant to climate change that people can actually control, that aren't there aren't so many sort of external factors controlling whether they can engage in them. Oh, thank you for your lecture. And uh, I have also two questions, actually. On one of the first slides, you showed um, that um, there, wa there was some previous research showing that um, re in people that had more knowledge about science also had, there was a big division between different uh, political um, positions. Mm -hmm. Um, and my first question is, is this something, this is not related to your study really, but is this something that is, n that you notice in the scientific debate? Um, so that's, that's the first thing I wonder, is there some, some, like a gap in the scientific debate between different, uh, and it's bigger than in the general public. Uh, and then my second question is, what about the teachers? Because the t this would, would typically, this in the school would typically be, uh, done in the science <coughs> classes, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so what about the teacher's attitudes? Um. Okay, so the first, I'll try to hit the first, actually, I'll do the second one because it's fresh in my mind. So in, in terms of teacher attitudes, th there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. We actually did a related study where we looked at the teacher's personal ideology and belief in climate change and also what they taught. And one of the, uh, we didn't connect it to the intergenerational part but just the teachers and the children. And one of the really fascinating things that we found is that even teachers that don't believe in it and even teachers who don't believe it's caused by humans, if they teach any of the curricula, so if they say, people out there say that climate change might be caught happening, that it might be related to greenhouse gases, that it might work this way, that the children in those classes are just as likely to think it's real as the children in the classes of the teachers who are believers, and the children in those classes are just as likely to believe that it's caused by people and that it poses risks. So basically, if the scientific content is taught at all, no matter whether the teachers believe it or even whether the teachers portray it as anthropogenic, the children all come to the same conclusion, so they figure it out. Uh, exactly how that sort of pans out when it goes all the way to parents, we, we don't have an answer to that. Then they choose not to teach it then. Yeah. So. That is an issue, and that's one of the things that um, I've talked to a couple people about so far. So in our school system, teachers have some leeway in the sense of 
framing that particular content as a hypothesis or sort of tentative or maybe not mentioning the anthropogenic part. But in most places, the basic science is required as a standard that students have to learn. And we have probably an overly aggressive accountability program where in a lot of places teachers' bonuses and even salary depends on the mastery of these standards at the end of the school year and standardized tests. So by and large, if it ends up in a standard, teachers teach it no matter what. It's just some teach a bit of it, some teach a lot of it, but they try to get the standard covered. And, and then the first question was about public discussion and how it relates to the sort of political divide and, and science knowledge. Well, from what I understood, uh, um, um, people with more knowledge about science and uh, if they had um, conservative um, political stand and they were more um, skeptical about climate change and it was the opposite for people with the more um, left Correct. politics mm -hmm. stand. Yeah. So I was wondering if that's some no something that is noticed in debate in universities and in science in general, that it's a bigger gap there. Um, yes and no. <laughs> so I would say within the debate at universities, and universities have been criticized for this to some degree in the context of climate change, um, we have relatively high science literacy but we also have just the people who are on the political left <laughs> who have <laughs> science literacy. So we don't have the context for this debate. It's, it's like w w one of the things that's interesting when we're talking about promoting diversity within the university is probably the rarest possible perspective at a university is that of the political right. <laughs> Thanks very much for the talk. That was very, very fascinating. Uh, uh, the effect of your treatment, uh, uh, sorry, the effect uh, that you of your treatments was really huge. That uh, changing someone who a denial to being concerned about the climate change that's really massive. Uh, and I'm just curious to know that uh, how exactly children so sort of teach their parents uh, when they actually deny the climate change. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the question is kind of like, how, how are the children going about doing this teaching? Yeah, right? so the how exactly yeah, children actually change their parents? Yeah. So there's sort of two answers to that question. One is I really wish I knew. So I, I think one slight difference between this type of research uh, in the U.S. And, and here is we have uh, the institutional review boards that do sort of have oversight of all the social research we do, and they're very sort of picky about uh, sort of imposing on people's lives or listening into private conversations and things like that. It's very difficult to do. So even though we collected all the data, we didn't have eyes and ears on these conversations. And I'd love to do that at some point in the future. So that's one answer. The other answer is that we designed the curricula to encourage specific behaviors at home, one of which was interviewing parents. So the children went to the parents and asked them over your life in this community, and these especially the rural areas along the coastal co uh, coast of North Carolina, aren't ones that have really high migration rates. So a lot of these people are people who've lived there their whole life. And they were asking them, since you were little, how has the weather changed? And we didn't actually ask them, how has the climate changed? Because very, that's very politically contentious. But if you're saying, how, is the weather pattern, how have the weather patterns changed from when you were a little kid to many decades later, that long-term patterns and weather changes is climate change, right? So they interviewed them about that, and that hopefully was a forum for discussion between the children and the parents. Uh, the children also developed like online blog posts about their citizen science projects, um, which hopefully was a, something that elicited conversation with them because they could show their parents the story of their citizen science project, and those uh, or, or service learning projects, and those projects that they did were related to climate change. So they were dealing with sea level rise and things like that with their wetland restorations. So we intended that to be a source of conversation as well. Thanks very much. Yeah. Hi. For me, it was really nice that you emphasized how rigid the opinions of grown-ups are and how we're really, like, even learning more about science reinforces the existing opinion. And speaking of that, could you go to a slide with the partisan support? 
because it seems like something in 2005 happened which changed the opinion of many non-party aligned people. Like in 2005, you see that it line de decoupled between Democrats and independent. So I'm interesting in, uh, interested, do you have any knowledge what actually happened back then that changed the opinion of non-party aligned people? So this is w one quick bit of context I should have explained this, is the 15 is 2015. So these are ranging from sort of the late 90s to 2015. And then... So the left, to me, left oh, and the blue, left right. one. You see um, how, how blue and gray lines decouple from each other in 2005? So my only thought there, this is sort of, is this a priority issue? And this is environmental protection, right? And so my, my explanation there might be that we were sort of losing the independent group there because I, I think they kind of are a little bit merged. It's hard to see exactly where it happened. I think that's also where we saw the sort of peak of economic activity to the Great uh, Recession about that time. And I could see basically economic hardship potentially being linked to people saying it's not a top issue anymore once once I deal with my foreclosure, then it can be a, a top issue again it, within independence. Yeah, but anyways, looking at these historical events that really swayed the opinions, maybe offer some, some takeaway messages together with children how we can influence the, the, the opinions. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the talk. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, one of my questions got, just got answered over there, but I was wondering, um, it's interesting that, that moms are less denialist and it's also interesting how daughters are better at influencing parents. Uh, wh what's your conclusion on that? Why do you think that is? Um, so the easy answer for moms versus fathers is even within households, there's a ideological divide where males tend to be more right-leaning and individualistic and females tend to be more sort of collectivistic and communitarian. So that could explain the initial difference between the uh, fathers and mothers. Uh, in terms of why daughters are more effective than sons, uh, this is one, like in the paper, we said we need further research, right? So, so the initial difference where parents of sons were actually sort of more uh, or more concerned about climate change, we sort of tied that into some really limited research that suggests sons are treated more as sort of conveyors of science within U.S. households, and so maybe that parents just kind of listen to them. The reason why girls became better messengers after the treatment we're not sure, that, I mean, it would just be total conjecture. Maybe as parents, we're more sympathetic to our daughters than our sons in terms of listening to them or something. I only have a daughter, so <laughs> if I had a son, I could maybe give you my w sample size of one perspective on it, but <laughs> I'd welcome any feedback from anyone on that one. <laughs> yeah, I was also wondering, what, what I mean, uh, how's the, uh, have you seen any, any effects of, of the, I mean, the strikes and the fu Fridays for Future and stuff like that in, in the United States so far? I mean, that's also a way of children sort of conveying right. a message too. Yeah. So my perspective is that part of the reason those have been a powerful message or been effective globally is because they're led by children. But at the same time, I, they haven't been that strong of an influence in the U.S. And also my impression is the sort of ideological bubbles that people are in uh, have not been pierced by this particular phenomenon. So on the political left, people are very aware of it and think it's a really cool thing. And on the political right, people don't know that it's happening. So. Thank you. Okay, last question. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, where this will go, is it possible that this curriculum can be added to schools across the U.S.? I hope. <laughs> so there, there's a, like, I, I lose track of all the acronyms in my life, but there's a network that's called CLEAN that posts curricula relevant to climate change, and it's available there. 
and then uh, my colleague uh, Catherine Stevenson has on her webpage, so it's openly available. But like a lot of academics, we probably haven't done enough of our sort of due diligence in terms of the outreach associated th with this once we've done our science. So, so it's out there, and I think it would be just a wonderful thing if it was picked up na nationally. Uh, I, I think one trick for, for getting it to be used nationally is key elements of the curricula were based on local contexts and local species. And for it to be effective, I think adopters elsewhere would need to do the legwork to bring in local species and local contexts, because that's one of the ways that it becomes more relevant to the students and more relatable to their parents. So I'm looking forward to your next study on cultural differences also in this area. So uh, Nils will be here for a couple of minutes, so you can confront him with any question that you have left. But we say thank you. Thank you.